of the Subcommittee on the Near East, South Asia, Central Asia, and Counterterrorism to order. Someday we will find a way to rename this subcommittee that uh, something shorter. I thought about the acronym. I don't yeah, know. I haven't yet. I haven't worked it out. But uh, for now, we are Near East, South Asia, Central Asia, and Counterterrorism, and we welcome uh, both uh, the Honorable Donna Liu and the Honorable Jeffrey Pyatt uh, to testify before us today. Senator Young and I will make some uh, brief opening comments, and then we'll turn uh, to both of you for your opening statements and then questions from the members. Uh, we are convening the subcommittee today to discuss Central Asia. And when we talk about Central Asia, we're talking about Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyz Republic. Um, this hearing comes at a really opportune time, a week after Secretary Blinken traveled to the region for the first time, and a year after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has, frankly, shifted the geopolitical landscape in Central Asia. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has accelerated geopolitical competition that was already underway in the region, as Central Asian states seek to balance their dependence on any one regional power. Preoccupied in Ukraine, Russia is struggling to preserve its traditional influence, some might say dominance, in the region or parts of the region. It's redeployed many of the troops that were stationed in the region to Ukraine, and Central Asian governments appear to be rethinking Russia's ability to serve as a dependable security provider and mediator on regional security and economic issues. Meanwhile, China, like it is everywhere, it's ramping up. It's already active engagement in Central Asia, seeking to build on its really big uh, economic investments in the region and expand its influence into the diplomatic and sec security spheres. This is you know, the same story we hear everywhere around the world, but um, maybe more acute in neighboring Central Asia. Turkey, India, Iran, and the EU are also exploring new openings and offering Central Asian states opportunities for greater connectivity to the outside world. Now, the United States has been a friend and a partner to Central Asian states for the last 30 years. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, we were the first nation to recognize, for instance, Kazakhstan's independence. And our support for the independent sovereignty and territorial integrity of Central Asian countries, it's been a cornerstone of U.S. policy ever since. Russia's brutal war of aggression in Ukraine reminds us that uh, the words, these principles, of sovereignty and independence, they have real meaning, especially for a region long dominated by Moscow. And frankly, the invasion has reminded these Central Asian countries that relying on Vladimir Putin to guarantee your independence is a really, really bad bet. The United States is also, frankly, rethinking whether the ways we have dealt with these nations needs to change. I would argue that it does. For the last 20 years, our engagement in Central Asia was focused, arguably, primarily on ensuring supply routes for U.S. military operations in Afghanistan. However, it's past time to recognize that our efforts and our interests in Central Asia are broader, and that one of the benefits of our withdrawal from Afghanistan is that now our policy in Central Asia doesn't need to be dominated by protecting our presence inside the Afghan civil war. This is um, part of uh, the world, this is a part of the world that does have incredible untapped potential, and that's one of the things we want to focus on today. The people of Central Asia, they want a connection with the American people. Central Asia, as we know, is rich in critical resources like hydrocarbons and rare earth minerals. There are investment opportunities, connections between U.S. businesses and Central Asian businesses. And we also want to work closely with Central Asian states to maximize the impact of our sanctions against Russia and provide alternatives to Russian-made military equipment. However, this is the final thing I'll say, our policies in Central Asia do need to be realistic, and our eagerness to build uh, new ties should not unnecessarily tie us to despotic regimes there. This is a region whose countries are ranked among the least free and least democratic in the world. And let's be honest, we've had little success in a lot of our engagement there on human rights issues. This is a region where Russia and China are still deeply invested in engaged and where we saw time after time the limits of our influence during the war in Afghanistan. 
I'm so encouraged by the Biden administration's focus on the C5 plus one diplomatic platform. I'm eager to learn more about that today, but also how we can really set a digestible series of objectives for our engagement in the region. So I look forward to hearing more about the administration's vision for a right-sized U.S. role in the region in the post-Afghanistan war, post-Ukraine invasion world. I look forward to hearing how Secretary Blinken's visit to the region last week helped advance these objectives, including a firsthand account from Assistant Secretary Liu, who is on the Secretary's trip. And finally, I look forward to our witnesses' views on the steps the United States Congress can take to improve our relations with Central Asian states. Senator Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I want to welcome uh, Assistant Secretary Liu, Assistant Secretary Pyatt uh, to the subcommittee. As we said in other subcommittee hearings, this topic is critical for us to examine because we know that great uh, power competition is not confined to one particular geographic region. Similarly, America's role in an often under-resourced re region of the world has never been more important. Building on Secretary Blinken's recent visit and in light of the ongoing tragic conflict in Ukraine, I'm glad we're holding this hearing to examine our relationship with Central Asian countries and to identify where opportunities and challenges exist. As we look at geopolitical competition in Central Asia, we must do so with the people, the people in mind. The future in Central Asia must be one where human rights are valued, where economic activity is flourishing, the private sector is engaged, and the people are determining their own future for themselves. Neither Russia nor China can help deliver this future for these societies. As evidenced by the continuing crisis in Ukraine, Russia does not care about human lives, nor does it value a country's sovereignty. The tragedy in Ukraine must be a wake-up call to those in the region who still see relations with Russia as something to be pursued. And in China, we've witnessed horrific policies in Xinjiang targeting ethnic minorities who also call these countries home, and yet many are still content to trade with China and deepen ties via the Belt and Road Initiative. These countries must realize the nature of who they're working with and realize that partnering with the United States and others presents a much better opportunity. Of course, we must take actions uh, to become that partner of choice. The chairman mentioned adjustments to Jackson Vanek. I'm open to discussing this and other ideas further. With Russia occupied by the war in Ukraine, now is a historic opportunity for Central Asian countries to chart for themselves a new course in their history one that secures their sovereignty and economic stability for their people and avoids dependence on a larger coercive neighbor in either Moscow or Beijing. I believe we're at a crossroads in our relationship with the region and we must seize this opportunity to be the partner of choice. I'm pleased we're here to discuss such an important issue. Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Senator Young. Looking forward to your testimony. I'll introduce both of our witnesses and then ask uh, Secretary Liu to begin, followed by uh, Secretary Pyatt. It's uh, our pleasure to introduce the Honorable Donald Liu, Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs. Assistant Secretary Liu previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan and Albania, held other important positions in India, Azerbaijan. Uh, Secretary Pyatt, uh, well known to this committee, is the Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Resources. Assistant Secretary Pyatt previously served as U.S. Ambassador to both Greece and Ukraine, holding other important positions in India and Vienna. Um, first to you, Secretary Liu, then to you, uh, Secretary Pyatt, look forward to your testimony today. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, colleagues, uh, as was mentioned, I just returned on Friday from Central Asia with the Secretary. It was his first visit to the region as Secretary of State, and I am pleased to report each of the countries is eager for more U.S. engagement. We saw real and substantial opportunity there. What I would propose to do is say a few words about Central Asia and Ukraine, then I'll talk about the economies of the region and how Russia's war in Ukraine is affecting the lives of everyday people. And finally, I want to say a few words about human rights. The governments of Central Asia have been under intense pressure to support Putin's invasion of Ukraine. They have been pressured to send troops from Central Asia to fight and they have refused. They have been pressured to recognize Russia's purported annexation of parts of Ukraine, and they have refused. They have been pressured to publicly endorse Putin's claims that Ukraine is merely a part of Russia. 
Not only have they refused, several have loudly and clearly said that they support Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. Now, it's true that Central Asian countries have abstained on UN resolutions condemning the Russian invasion, but I'd argue that even that is a courageous act as they have been under enormous pressure to vote against these resolutions. People in Central Asia have historically had strong ties to both Russia and Ukraine. Many of them studied in Ukraine, did business there, or have friends and family living in Ukraine. People in Central Asia have responded with compassion to the suffering, suffering of Ukrainians. They have sent tons of humanitarian supplies, blankets, clothing, food, medicine. When Russia destroyed some of Ukraine's electrical grid, Central Asians sent generators. Private citizens in Kazakhstan raised money to send yurts to Ukraine, where regular people who suddenly found themselves without electricity and without heat could come out of the cold, get a hot cup of tea, charge their cell phones. They called these the yurts of invincibility. Secretary Blinken told his Central Asian counterparts that the United States sees the hardship in Central Asia caused by Putin's war of aggression, and we want to help. We see the rising food and fuel prices. We see the rising unemployment levels. We see difficulties in importing and exporting goods to and from the region. We see large numbers of migrants coming from Russia to escape conscription. Last year, the Congress generously provided $41.5 million in new assistance to help Central Asia meet these challenges. Of that amount, 16.5 million is being used to promote food security. The remaining 25 million is being used to retrain workers to reduce unemployment, to pilot new trade routes that do not go through Russia or China, and to help private sector businesses to succeed and to grow. Last week, Secretary Blinken announced that we'd be working with the Congress to secure an additional $20 million to support these programs. He also announced $5 million to support regional connectivity through economic and energy programs. We want to show that we are a reliable partner that acknowledges the hardships caused by Russia's war of aggression. Mr. Chairman, I have had the opportunity to work and live in Central Asia on and off for the past 20 years. Most of us expect to see progress on human rights proceeding at a snail's pace. I am happy to report that we've seen some important strides just in the past year. In Uzbekistan, the International Labor Organization has recognized the end to systemic state-sponsored forced labor and child labor in the cotton harvest. The government of Uzbekistan achieved this through implementing a series of presidential decrees that prohibited the use of forced and child labor in the cotton production and abolished cotton quotas at the national and local levels. In Kazakhstan, the courts convicted three policemen in January for torturing detainees after video footage emerged showing beatings and other physical abuse. In February, the courts convicted five more policemen charged with torturing detainees with a hot iron. These are small numbers, and steps remain to hold security services fully accountable, but these convictions reflect a presidential priority to end torture and physical abuse in places of detention. This is a goal that we fully support. There's a lot more that needs to be done in Central Asia to prevent human rights abuses, to promote freedom of religion and labor rights, and to secure a free press. Seeing these steps over the past year makes me optimistic that with the help of partners, Central Asian countries can make important progress in the short term in improving respect for human rights. Let me end where I began. The countries of Central Asia are under tremendous pressure from Moscow. They do not want to be caught up in Putin's war. They want to live in freedom and decide their future for themselves. We can support these aims through well-crafted foreign assistance programs, with support for human rights, and most importantly, with our sincere engagement. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Secretary Pyatt. Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member Young, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the administration's efforts to strengthen energy security and accelerate energy transition in Central Asia. Over the past year, Vladimir Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine and weaponization of energy have disrupted global markets in ways that will ripple for years to come, including in Central Asia. For most of the world, Russia will never again be viewed as a reliable energy supplier. But facing setbacks in Ukraine, 
Putin has sought to reassert influence over the countries that Russia traditionally considered within its sphere. Although Central Asia has some of the world's largest fossil fuel deposits and notable renewable energy potential, the region is also landlocked and vulnerable, with access to global markets presenting logistical and geopolitical challenges. My colleagues in the State Department's Bureau of Energy Resources and I seek to strengthen Central Asia's energy security, provide a strategic counterweight to malign actors, and support Central Asian countries in achieving their climate goals. Reflecting today's energy security challenges and the administration's focus on energy security, transition, and access, ENR has increased its foreign assistance budget requests within the department's overall request to 30.5 million in FY23. We appreciate Congress's past and continued support for our work to ensure the United States is the preferred partner for Central Asian countries in energy security and transition. Since my first week as Assistant Secretary, I have prioritized ENR engagement with Kazakhstan, reflecting that country's potential on a broad range of Bureau priorities, including energy security, renewables, methane abatement, nuclear, and critical minerals. At a time when global energy markets are tight, every barrel counts. Kazakhstan exports 1% of total global crude oil production, most of which is handled by two American energy companies. 80% of its exports leave through the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, which terminates in the Russian port of Novorossiysk. Through the revitalized U.S.-Kazakhstan Strategic Energy Dialogue, ENR, along with the Department of Energy and other State Department stakeholders, is supporting the government of Kazakhstan to strengthen its energy security by accelerating transition and diversifying export routes. In February, with U.S. encouragement, the state-owned energy companies of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan finalized a commercial agreement to ship an additional 1.5 million tons of oil per year via the Caspian and Azerbaijan to global customers, covering about 2% of Kazakh net exports. By focusing further on regional connectivity and export routes across the Caspian, Central Asian countries will have options that enable them to stand firm in the face of malign influence. And in addition to Russia, China plays an important role in Central Asia's energy sector and is the dominant recipient of Central Asia's exported gas. In 2021, the PRC imported 26% of its natural gas from Central Asia, mainly Turkmenistan. The United States encourages Turkmenistan to consider options for diversifying its natural gas exports, including to Europe. That will hinge, however, on the Turkmenistan government making their market more attractive to Western energy companies. Aging fossil fuel infrastructure and poor leakage controls lead to high methane emissions from oil and gas production in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan, for instance, is the world's fourth largest emitter from oil and gas methane. Just yesterday, I joined former Secretary Kerry urging the Kazakh energy minister to join the Global Methane Pledge, through which participants commit to contribute to a collective effort to reduce global methane emissions by at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. And of course, the most effective way to increase energy security is for all the Central Asian countries to accelerate their clean energy transitions. Central Asia has abundant wind and solar potential. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan use hydroelectricity for significant portions of their power generation. But as climate, ge climate change shrinks the mountain glaciers supplying hydroelectric dams, that zero carbon power source dwindles, harming energy security and exacerbating regional conflicts over water access and management. In Istanbul last October, I met with the deputy energy ministers of Tajikistan, the Kyrgyz Republic, and Uzbekistan, all of whom emphasized the need to preserve and develop the region's renewable energy resources. A pacing factor in the energy transition will be the availability of critical energy minerals. As the world transitions to a clean energy economy, global demand for these critical minerals is set to skyrocket by 400 to 600 percent. Central Asia has sizable critical minerals and rare earth element resource potential, and the State Department is expanding our work in this area. Kazakhstan, meanwhile, produces 45 percent of the global uranium supply and is looking to deepen cooperation with the United States, including on technologies like small and modular reactors. When Central Asia gained independence from the Soviet Union 31 years ago, the United States was among the region's first partners and first sources of foreign direct investment in the oil and gas sectors. As we face today's pressing challenges, Central Asia has the potential to be a valuable partner in our work on the geopolitics of energy 
and ENR is eager to develop this opportunity. Thank you again for the committee's support in this effort, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Well, thank you both for your testimony, um, and we'll begin uh, questioning. We've got uh, members of the subcommittee that are tuning in from offices, and we may be joined later by other members uh, in person. Um, let me direct my first question to you, Secretary Liu. When you testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee in September, uh, you stated the administration's support for the repeal of the 1974 Jackson Vanek Amendment as it applies uh, towards Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. This strikes me as a, as a really smart idea and a pretty easy way for Congress and the administration to stand together in our support for deeper engagement with the region. This is an amendment that is a you know, pretty major irritant in our bilateral relations. It comes up a lot when you talk to these nations. It sort of suggests that we still view Central Asia through a Soviet-era lens. Um, but we have um, failed to repeal the amendment as it applies to three of these countries, even though we've repealed the amendment as it applies to Russia, um, amongst some of the others in the region. Can you just explain the rationale for uh, repealing Jackson Vanek as it applies to uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, in the Secretary, uh, Secretary Blinken's trip to Central Asia last week, this was raised at each one of the meetings with, our, with his counterparts in Central Asia. It is a real drain on the sense of trust uh, between our countries. Uh, the Jackson Bank, as you know, was originally created to put pressure on the Soviet Union to allow the immigration of Soviet Jews from the Soviet Union to the United States and to Israel. Uh, it provides um, four criteria to judge countries on, uh, uh, looking at their ability to let people emigrate, to leave the country. Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan have fulfilled those criteria for 25 years. We completely agree with your statement that at a time when we are trying to help them diversify away from Russia, that this would be a strong signal that we are interested in deepening our economic engagement. Uh, great, and I was glad to hear Senator Young's uh, interest in this issue, and you know, I look forward to working with him and, and others. This strikes me as something we could do on a bipartisan basis to support the administration's efforts. Um, Secretary Pyatt, I wanted to, you're such, so good at sort of pulling the conversation out of the weeds. Um, the problem you described in Turkmenistan seems to be a problem without a current solution from the United States. So this is a country rich in uh, natural resources. They are selling predominantly to China today. And we are not getting the benefit of those resources because as you identified, um, internal conditions, aging infrastructure, a set of rules that investors can't count on. Um, the problem is there's not a lot of reason for Turkmenistan to change because they've got a very willing partner who's willing to pay them what they see as a fair price, a partner, in fact, who is invested in sort of keeping that country a backwater, a country that doesn't support the rule of law. Um, and, and so to me, you know, public shaming or small-scale incentives, you know, don't seem to be the answer here. I have never understood why, this is my editorial, why we don't spend more hard dollars on energy security. Um, why we spend $700 billion on the military and next to nothing on actually helping to connect countries in Central Asia to Europe and to the United States, for instance. Because if we've learned anything in our fight in Ukraine, alongside the Ukrainians, is that, um, you can't have territorial integrity without energy security, and that Russia is using Europe's lack of energy security in particular, but also our lack of energy security as a means to undercut the territorial integrity of both Ukraine and Europe. And so how do you take Turkmenistan, take other countries in the region where we wanna have um, a more robust energy relationship, we wanna help them connect to Europe, um, but, it's corruption, old infrastructure that stands in the way. Do we have this set of tools right now to help change that reality, or do we need to think about a, a, a new suite of tools? Thank you, Senator. And let me start my answer by noting that I spent 
yesterday and Monday in Houston at what is arguably the world's biggest energy conference, meeting with ministers and corporate leaders from around the world. And it was really striking to me in that setting how the consensus has now emerged on the point I made in my opening statement, that Russia is off the table. Uh, this is an enormously important development, that the, the world has seen that Russia will not be a reliable energy supplier. Um, Vladimir Putin talks a lot about finding new markets in Asia uh, for the gas, which is no longer going to Europe. But it's notable that Gazprom was resorting to coercion with Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan just last month, trying to force them to sign up to new gas import agreements because he doesn't have a lot of good options. So a very large volume, perhaps on the order of 140 BCM of Russian gas is going to be shut in, which means that for the next few years, the world is gonna need all the gas that it can find elsewhere. And that was, that's particularly the case uh, for our European allies. I had good discussions with my EU counterpart on exactly this issue. And one of the places that Europe is looking to is, uh, is Ca the Caspian region and Central Asia. Um, the Azeris have made commitments with President von der Leyen uh, for a significant increase there, but there are also options, and the most important one is the one you alluded to, uh, Chairman, on, on, on Turkmenistan. Um, there, is, there is infrastructure that would have to be built in order to make that, that diversification of Turkmen gas uh, feasible, but there are also American companies and, and European firms that are interested in this. Um, and so I have committed to our engagement in ENR. I know Assistant Secretary Liu has been working on the same issues. Um, we very much look forward to Foreign Minister Moredov uh, coming to Washington before too long where we can continue that conversation. Um, but I also will say, I remember discussing exactly the same issue with Foreign Minister Moredov 10 years ago when I was the PDAS in, in Don's bureau, which tells you how embedded some of the, the challenges are. The other issue I would flag quickly in this regard is that this is one of those areas where we're really trying to do two things at the same time. We want to advance fossil energy security in order to deal with the fallout of Russia's invasion and Putin's weaponization of his oil and gas, but we also want to accelerate energy transition. And I think one of the areas where, we've, where we have potential to do a great deal more in Central Asia is helping those countries to build out their capacity for wind, for solar. Very excited about the interest I heard yesterday from the Kazakh energy minister on small and modular reactors. USAID has a program in this area called Power Central Asia, which is looking at the electricity interconnectors. My bureau, ENR, has done work in the area of uh, the regulatory structure for grid interconnections, but I would love to see us doing more in this area. I know having talked to four of the, the region's energy ministers, that there's appetite from the, for the United States to be more involved. This is where our toolkit, like XM and DFC, and the work that the Congress has done in this area is so important. Um, but we have to keep pushing because, as you noted, Chairman, um, China has sought to expand in this space. And, and again, Turkmenistan is the most dramatic example, the way in which China has hardwired Turkmen gas production into uh, the PRC's energy supply. Well, and w w why I think it's so important that you've constructed um, a process that brings all of these countries together is, you know, they also have some pretty powerful rivers, right? They've got, you know, real hydropower capacity, but what comes with that is potential conflict with those who are downstream. And so if you have, um, you know, a, a, a better, more functional forum to talk together about renewables, you can also make some progress on hydropower. Senator Young. Thanks, Chairman. We'll, we'll stay on the topic of, of Turkmenistan uh, for a moment. Uh, Secretary Pyatt, you indicated that the country is plagued by internal corruption, which inhibits them fully realizing their potential as it relates to oil and gas production, and, and uh, by extension, uh, companies like the or countries like the United States benefiting from uh, such production. They're also plagued by decrepit and, and dated infrastructure. Let's, let's talk about a distinct uh, potential vulnerability. I, I would like your assessment of Turkmenistan's uh, uh, vulnerability to economic coercion from China on account of their uh, uh, reliance, what I would characterize based on, on, on uh, all that I know, 
uh, about this topic is perhaps an over-reliance on China's market uh, for their oil and gas products. So, Senator, I would characterize Turkmenistan as vulnerable to malign influence from both Russia and China. Um, Turkmenistan was one of the poorest regions of the Soviet Union and saw tremendous environmental degradation because of the way that the Soviet Union approached the exploitation of Turkmenistan's oil and gas resources. Um, I think in the case of China as well, Turkmenistan by definition has tied itself very closely um, to China through um, the dependence on gas, which is the major source of the Turkmen budget, 75% of which is, is going to China. That again is why it's, it would be quite healthy to have American companies that are interested involved there. And, and I, would, I would just point right next door to Kazakhstan and the very constructive role that ExxonMobil and, and Chevron have played in helping to modernize the Kazakh energy system. And, and I would also emphasize that for those two American companies, um, Kazakhstan is a very important part of their, uh, their global production chain, and they are companies that have, have been there for more than two decades now and are committed to further grow that investment, bringing with them the package of values and business practices that we adhere to as Americans. So in addition to some of the lines of effort uh, that, that Senator Murphy teased out of uh, his conversation with you, I, I, I would suggest that uh, any instruments uh, that we can provide uh, our, our administration with to uh, assist countries in dealing with these coercive or, or malign economic activities uh, on the part of, of China or Russia in the future would be a positive thing. And, and Senator Coons and I have, have offered some legislation uh, it's been well received so far uh, that would assist countries who are experiencing economic coercion uh, through short-term provision of aid, reduction of tariffs and non-tariff barriers, and, and all manner of other measures. Uh, other governments are in the process of passing their own legislation to uh, assist uh, such countries that have been coerced, Japan, for example, and, and the ultimate vision is to, to weave these different lines of effort together uh, I think that'll be a subject of conversation at the G7 in Hiroshima in May. Um, I, I, I want <clears throat> to ask you about a couple of, of, of other topics. Well, uh, Central Asia, Mr. Pyatt, has, has, has uh, in addition to being a, a main source of oil and gas for the global economy since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we've seen an increased demand for critical minerals and the region could have a significant potential to be a, a geopolitical hotspot for mineral production. We know that China is actively increasing its economic clout uh, across the region, including in the mining sector through their Belt and Road Initiative. Unfortunately, without some proactive efforts from the U.S. working with our allies, China is going to continue to strengthen their already strong position in the global critical minerals uh, uh, supply chains and, and uh, markets. Uh, Secretary Pyatt, in your opinion, what role can Central Asia play in the global supply of critical minerals? And do you believe the region is strategically important with respect to uh, great power competition over critical minerals? Thank you for raising the question, Senator. And I've spent the past few months going around the world with a chart that shows the level of Chinese domination across all the key elements of the clean tech supply chain, from hydrogen electrolyzers to solar cells to battery minerals. We need to focus on this issue systematically. The Biden administration is doing so domestically through the IRA. Uh, but we're also working on these issues internationally. Central America is a potentially significant partner. Uh, right now, um, you've got Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, where China dominates those countries' mining sectors. I was discussing this issue just yesterday with the Kazakh energy minister and noting our strong interest in continuing to develop our critical minerals, both extraction and processing relationship with Kazakhstan. Very pleased to report that there's a new agreement between USGS and the Kazakh government to establish a Kazakh geographic survey and to perform the baseline that's necessary to answer your question because most of the mineral maps of Central Asia date back to the Soviet Union. So it's a matter of developing 
new baselines of what the possibility is. And then lastly, I would just like to circle back quickly on the issue I mentioned in my statement of uranium, which is so important to our collective commitment as the G7 to decoupling from Russian energy supplies. And the fact that the United States, like many other countries, um, still has a level of dependency on uh, Russia for our nuclear fuel supplies. And, and Kazakhstan is a, is a willing and eager partner with the United States in that effort to diversify. That strikes me as, as, as very encouraging, whether it's a uranium or, or other critical minerals, uh, that uh, the Kazakh government has, has agreed to partner with our USGS on, on conducting that survey. Have we seen other governments in the region uh, also cooperate with USGS and, and strike similar agreements? Senator, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I suspect the answer is no, because we, but I'll, I'll defer to my colleague in SCA whether, Don, you've got anything on any other prospects. From the United States side, what I would flag, Senator, is an initiative called the Mineral Security Partnership, a State Department program, basically to create, to create an alternative to China. Uh, we have an agreement among MSP partners to set high ESGs and to make clear to countries with resource endowments that China is not the only option, because that has been an overwhelming tendency, for instance, in Africa. So we have made clear um, that as the MSP develops, and we're focused now on the, the initial project development in the MSP framework with our other partners, uh, 13 other parties, 13 countries, um, that we are, we are willing to expand this exercise out to Central Asia um, as we find interest from the governments. Thank you. Senator Kane. Thank you to my colleagues and thank you to the witnesses for your service. Um, Secretary Liu, I would like to begin with you if I could. Virginia is, is home to one of the largest Uyghur American communities, proudly so. Uh, China has monitored and harassed these individuals on U.S. soil for their advocacy, but they've also monitored and harassed their family members in China, imprisoning some of them, and we're working on a number of constituent cases because of this. Um, the domestic policy of China toward not only Uyghurs, but Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, minority groups in China, who do endure horrific atrocities and human rights uh, abuses, is important. Talk to us about your engagement uh, regarding the PRC's atrocities against ethnic groups. Senator, my, my last job before this one was ambassador in the Kyrgyz Republic. I engaged every person I could in the government about the situation in Xinjiang and was surprised to find very little interest in the Kyrgyz Republic uh, about the genocide happening there. And as you've suggested, it's not only Uyghurs, there are ethnic Kyrgyz people related to people in the majority in Kyrgyzstan, uh, and they were not willing to raise their heads or to call out what's happening there. And I think this goes back to Senator Young's um, uh, views that economic coercion really works in this part of the world, that the Chinese have loaned so much money to some of these governments, they are unwilling to um, be seen as angering Beijing even when it comes to um, emotive issues like the treatment of fellow ethnic people mm -hmm. um, very close by into China. If I could add one other issue that I think gets very little attention, in Kazakhstan, um, they, they also have not raised publicly uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang, but they are successfully um, helping ethnic Kazakhs to leave China. Uh, they're doing this in cooperation with the Chinese government under the, the rubric of uh, family reunification, but thousands of ethnic Kazakhs have been able to leave Xinjiang to find lives in Kazakhstan, have been fast-tracked to citizenship and provided assistance and housing. I think that's something we should celebrate. I, I appreciate you mentioning that. I want to ask now a question about security assistance. Uh, the National Guard State Partnership Program has been a big success. I know many of my colleagues talk about the partnerships they have. Virginia seems to have an unlikely partnership as far as I'm concerned, but it's been a successful one with Tajikistan, and the, there has been direct military to military contacts, uh, uh, training in such areas as infantry tactics and combat casualty care. Uh, Tajik forces will travel to Virginia this summer to celebrate the 20 year of this partnership agreement with the Virginia National Guard. So I wonder about security cooperation in the region generally, 
Um, has the shifting geopolitical landscape in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine opened up any more opportunities for security partnership in the region? A absolutely is the answer. Uh, let me first say our state partnerships are amazing in Central Asia, a place that has historically been quite sensitive to outside militaries operating. Our, our state partnership programs are just so successful everywhere throughout the region. In terms of expanding security uh, engagement, what we all know is Russia has consumed a lot of uh, defense equipment in Ukraine, has gobbled up a lot of its munitions, and is going to find it very difficult to resupply its own stockpiles, but certainly to export to other countries will be very difficult for a long time if it ever is able to restore its position as a defense exporter. This is critical for countries in Central Asia, all of which rely on Russian hardware to defend their borders. And imagine if you're one of the frontline states with Afghanistan and suddenly you're worried about getting spare parts for your airplanes or bullets for your uh, rifles. This has got them very concerned. And so we are talking with them about where they might source defense equipment from, from us, from European partners, from South Korea, from Japan, from Israel. Would they have, the, would they have reticence about uh, incorporating us d deeper into these partnerships because of the, the first point that you raised, which is the economic coercion from China, you know, creates some challenges? Or does the fact that we've already had these state partnership programs give us a, a good toehold that we can potentially expand, expand in this time when Russia's influence is maybe a little bit uh, on the decline? I think uh, China has the advantage in being um, a replacement supplier because of cost. Yep. All the other countries I mentioned have an advantage because of quality. Everyone's seen how the Russian uh, equipment has performed on the battlefield in Ukraine. Frankly, the Chinese equipment is derived from Ch Russian technology, and so everyone wonders whether that'll work mm -hmm. either. There's a real interest in diversification. And uh, I, I think this is a perfect opportunity for these countries because the Russians know it'll be very hard for these countries to be supplied from Moscow. Thank you. And I have one more question, Mr. Chair, could I extend? Um, and again, for Secretary Liu, I've got a lot of constituents in Virginia who have been raising questions about violence against protesters in the Karakal, Pakistan region of Uzbekistan. So I, I'd like you to share any conversations you've had with the Uzbek government about the need for accountability, need for due process for defendants, standing trial, and other human rights concerns. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Secretary did raise um, the um, violent protests in Karakal, Pakistan, and the need for accountability, both on behalf of those who may have committed violence as protesters, but also on the behalf of the security forces who may have committed excesses. As we know, dozens of people were killed in that violence. What he was told is that there will be accountability. We are seeing right now open trials for the protesters. We were assured there would be open and transparent trials also for police and other security forces, some of whom have already been arrested for excesses committed in Karakal, Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Kane. We'll uh, do a, a second round if members have questions and then get you guys on your way. Um, let me um, ask you, Secretary Liu, about Afghanistan. Um, I framed in my opening remarks uh, how our policy towards the region is transformed by our um, lack of a need to have access to Afghanistan dominate that relationship. But the countries in the region are not eager for us to isolate Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, they are right now focused on the question of maintaining their own stability, ensuring their own security. Um, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan have seen missile strikes into uh, their sovereign territory, but those same countries are recommending that the United States not write off Afghanistan, that um, in fact they believe we have to have um, some functional relationship with the Taliban government um, if we also want to have a functional relationship with Central Asia, because they see their future, whether they like it or not, connected to the future of Afghanistan. And if we send Afghanistan down the river to perish, uh, that has consequences for Central Asia. So um, I know this is a very difficult question about how we, if we re-engage with the Taliban, but what is this? what are our Central Asian friends tell us about what they would like to see our policy towards Afghanistan be and how our Afghanistan policy can help or hinder our relationship with Central Asia? Uh, so the Central Asians do not speak with one voice. As you may know, Uzbekistan 
and Turkmenistan, both who share borders with Afghanistan, are eager for more international influence on the Taliban to try to stabilize the situation there, to normalize it, to normalize borders and trade and security. Tajikistan has uh, had a very different view. Tajikistan feels incredibly threatened by the Taliban, um, and they uh, believe the Taliban to have killed uh, tens of thousands of ethnic Tajiks in Afghanistan. They have quite a confrontational perspective on this. So I think two of the governments on the border would like us to be engaged with the Taliban. Actually, the Tajiks are, are resistant to that. I think they want to see um, us helping them to reinforce security along their border. That's where they see the answer. In response, um, we are certainly talking to the Central Asians about what influence they have on the Taliban, how we can work together on issues such as the rights of women and girls, how we can work together to talk about uh, the potential for um, pressuring the Taliban to fulfill their commitments uh, to not allow terrorist groups from operating in their territory. Both Tajikistan and Uzbekistan have had rocket attacks from ISIS-K from northern Afghanistan. They're very aware of the threat that the, is posed to their societies. Um, and finally, um, Secretary Pyatt, I wanted to sort of circle back to this conversation about rare earth minerals and sort of ask a version of the same question I asked you about Turkmenistan and natural gas. You, uh, you talked about how China dominates that space right now um, and how we, of course, would like to effectuate a policy that changes that. And my question is the same. Do we have currently a suite of policies that allow us to uh, make a different offer um, that is be better than the Chinese offer? Is, for instance, the DFC um, a, a player here of consequence? It, it strikes me that we can you know, offer USGS, right? The United States government can do a survey, but we can't extract, right? We need a private sector partner to extract. And the private sector in the United States or Europe looks at these countries and says, fraught with too much peril. And again, on rare earth minerals, what's the way to solve that? What's the way to get US or European aligned private sector companies in to do the extraction? So, Chairman, that is exactly what we are trying to do through the Mineral Security Partnership, which is to bring together countries with a resource endowment, with countries that have the capital and the industries, to create, as I always put it, a door number two. Door number one is China, which has been very good at going out to the world, hoovering up or bringing it back to China, where all the processing and value addition happens, and then selling it to the world. We're now trying to break that model. Um, MSP depends on, and the projects which MSP is developing, depends on the resources that MSP partners are able to bring to bear. In the United States case, those resources are provided to state and USAID by, by Congress. Exim and, and DFC play a critical role. And then we also have what Amos Hochstein is doing with the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. In a similar way, trying to rack up the, the, the infrastructure and commodity opportunities where we need to bring the whole toolkit of US economic statecraft to bear. Um, I think if I had to prioritize looking at Central Asia today, um, I would prioritize as exactly as I did in my statement first on, on Kazakhstan because it's so vast and because there's such a clear signal from President Tokayev's administration in terms of the desire to deepen ties with the United States and because it's a much more developed economy. That's why having this initiative from USGS uh, is, is so welcome and so important. Um, I've spoken to a lot of uh, mining company CEOs in my, my new role. Uh, they all emphasize to me the incredible long lead time that it takes. These are, these are sectors where 10 or 15 years is the usual uh, period for the first return on investment. So it's really important that we get moving now if we're going to have the resources that we need to power our own energy transition. Uh, and I'm constantly asking industry people whether they think that we're going to hit the cliff on, on copper or on cobalt or on lithium. And we're all hoping that the market does what's necessary and that some of this will come from the United States. But I was just with Secretary Granholm yesterday in Houston, and she too was emphasizing that the United States is not going to be able to fulfill 
these needs, even for our domestic requirements, from mining here in the U.S. So we need to build these international partnerships, setting the highest ESG standards. Well, and as you mentioned, that requires uh, the, the partners in this initiative, the United States included, to come to the table with capital. Uh, that is provided to you by Congress. It strikes me that this issue of critical mineral, sec mineral security is you know, not a partisan one. I think there's support on both sides of the aisle. And yet we're you know, hearing murmurs from the House that they're going to propose a 40% you know, cut to state and USAID. There's really not much separation between soft and hard power these days. And to rob uh, this uh, administration of the ability to help secure critical minerals overseas um, seems like um, you know, an effort to cut off our nose to spite our face. So uh, I'll leave it there, Senator Young. Thank you. Um, it seems to me as we think about uh, mineral security and, and uh, 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 that topic, we also, of course, would need to consider regulatory reform. So I do agree with the president's refrain that uh, domestic security is national security and economic security. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll find some willing partners from the administration on, on that front. I'm not here to ask you about that today. but. Um, I do want to ask uh, a, a, a question uh, broadly about the region. As, as Russian dominance is in the region is waning, it, it, it seems to be viewed as an opportunity for others uh, to play a leadership role in the region, whether that's Turkey, Iran, India, or others. Turkey's formed its own regional C4 plus one organization of Turkic states. Uh, both Turkey and Iran have exported combat drones to uh, the Central Asian region and promised to produce them in Kyrgyzstan and, and Tajikistan. Uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi held his own virtual C5 plus one last year as well. Secretary Liu, um, as we reflect on, on Secretary Blinken's recent visit, what actions are we taking and what can this committee, uh, this subcommittee, uh, do to help ensure uh, these countries remain in a favorable position toward the U.S. and our interests. Senator Young, when we were in Central Asia last week, um, uh, several of the governments actually thanked us for the C5 plus one format because so many other countries have now copied the format. Russians have copied it, Chinese, South Koreans, the Japanese, the EU. And we saw um, just this week a few days after Secretary Blinken traveled to the region to have this face-to-face -face meeting with five foreign ministers, the Chinese have announced they're going to do the, exactly the same thing. They want to have the first ever face-to-face -face meeting of the C5. We see Putin getting on the phone and calling up uh, the presidents of uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the same two presidents uh, Secretary Blinken saw last week. Uh, I think it's a good sign that uh, other countries are noticing our engagement, are nervous about it, and want to compete. As you suggest, there are many competitors in Central Asia, uh, Turkey, Iran, India, the, the EU. Uh, I, I, for one, think that the best thing that Central Asians can do is take what all of us have to offer and take the best deal. Uh, where, where we have seen real problems is when there isn't competition. I, I served in the Kyrgyz Republic. For more than a decade, the Chinese were allowed to give loans to this country without any other country stepping forward, and they produced terrible outcomes. My daughter has asthma thanks to Chinese investment. They have a renovated Soviet electricity and heating plant in the, in the capital that just belches smoke all winter long, and kids and adults end up in the hospital because this is just terrible uh, infrastructure investment. That's because no one was there to compete. Go to Kazakhstan, the U.S. is the number two investor in Kazakhstan. China is number seven. Number one is the Netherlands. Actually, investment there works pretty well, and the Chinese are forced to build quality infrastructure and actually abide by normal rules of operation. We need to compete, and so that's DFC. It's private investment. What Congress can do is give us the tools to compete. Thank you. Congress, uh, one, one thing, if, if, if we're less comfortable providing resources, seems we're always comfortable sanctioning bad actors. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, to uh, 
to the detriment of, of the larger goals we're trying to realize. Um, I wrestle sometimes with how much we sanction. Uh, uh, Russia is a, a great example. Their, their economy grew, according to the IMF, I think it was 2.1, or it declined 2.1% uh, last year. That's, that's a decline. That's a contraction, but uh, not as significant as many may have, have thought they would. And, and um, with, with that in mind, and sanctions, of course, have their, have their place. As, as we continue to consider uh, additional sanctions a, against uh, Russian leaders and, and others, um, how do we balance our desire to sanction Russia and cripple the Russian military machine, the military-industrial complex, without driving these, these Central Asian countries, which depend on their relationship uh, with Russia, towards adversaries? Senator, that is a great question, and I think many of our Central Asian partners um, echo that sense that uh, they want to hear from us loud and clear that they are not the targets of our sanctions. When Secretary Blinken was in the region last week, he said loud and clear to the presidents of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and the four ministers of all five, it is not the intention of the U.S. government to target the people of Central Asia. It is our intention to target Putin's war machine. And we're going to work with you to make sure we minimize the impact on your economies. And so some of the best examples of our ability to do that have been in the oil sector that Jeff referred to. 90% uh, of Kazakh oil transits Russia to get out to world markets. It's important to us that that oil reach world markets to stabilize the price, to get to European and other consumers, it was important for us early on, right after the invasion, for us to give a letter of comfort that the CPC pipeline, which is built across Russia, is not subject to sanction because that's where that oil passes through. Also, just um, today, we saw a second um, bank in Kazakhstan um, able to be given a letter of comfort so it wouldn't be subject to US sanctions. It was subject to sanctions uh, initially, these were big Russian banks, Alpha Bank and um, what's now called Barakay Bank. But um, they have now become Kazakh banks because smart people in Kazakhstan realize these banks under U.S. sanction would not be able to continue to perform uh, profitably. And this was a business opportunity for Kazakh people to take those assets at pretty reasonable prices and turn them into assets for Central Asia. That's the kind of use of the sanctions that we want to see, and we're working very closely with all five countries to try to make sure that's possible. So if I'm looking for a magic recipe, uh, to tease out of that, uh, robust diplomacy to inform uh, the development and the evolution of, of a particular sanctions regime, and then where possible provide alternatives to these uh, countries, uh, economic relations they have with uh, a, a, a malign actor like Russia. Is that a pretty good? Completely agree, yes. Okay, thank you. Chairman? Great, Senator Kane. Uh, just one more question for you. Secretary Pyatt, I was reading your written testimony. I arrived after you delivered your verbal testimony, but I was intrigued about your reference to your October visit in Istanbul with the deputy energy ministers from Tajikistan, Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, and they're emphasizing the need to move forward in the renewable uh, resources space. Talk to me a little bit about the, the move toward renewable resources in the region. No, thank you for raising it, Senator. Let me say, you know, there's not a week that's gone by in my job where I haven't thought about your observation during my confirmation hearing about the, the different objectives that we're trying to balance in our energy security and energy transition agendas. And Central Asia really encapsulates that in so many ways. It's a region of significant fossil fuel endowment. It's also a region of high vulnerability. Um, the two mountain countries, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, acutely vulnerable to the effects of climate change, destroying their hydroelectric potential with, with melting glaciers. Um, they're also in the geopolitical crosshairs, squeezed between Iran, Russia, and, and China. Um, so I, frankly, when I was, when I was in uh, Istanbul and had this opportunity, I was really pleasantly surprised coming back to this region after 10 years 
to hear how strongly focused in particular the Uzbeks were on their energy transition. And I think it's because it is an existential issue for them. Um, they wanted to talk to me about how to better access resources from the EBRD uh, to finance new grid infrastructure. And just like here in the United States, the Central Asians have huge challenges if they're going to electrify their Soviet era energy systems. They have They've huge... been black, having blackout problems and that are pretty notable. Exactly. And, and so there's a real eagerness for engagement there. Um, th those three countries don't have the attractiveness that Kazakhstan has in terms of the size and the, the economic opportunity that draws in big American investors. So there in particular, the work that we're able to do with USAID and, and DFC and, and, and XM is, is critically important. But I think what's striking to me is that we don't have to convince any of these countries about the criticality of the climate crisis because they see it, they're vulnerable to it. Many of them, agriculture is a significant part of, of the economy and the, that agriculture is, de is dependent on seasonality and melting glaciers and, and water access. So um, I think we've got a, a real opportunity there, especially in the context of the geopolitical moment that both Chairman Murphy and, and Senator Young referred to. Um, Russia's stock is falling because of Putin's egregious actions in Ukraine and, and the fear that that has induced that Central Asia could be subject to the same kind of revanchist appetite. Um, and China, is, is, especially by the smaller countries, is, is viewed, as, as Don alluded to, as not a terribly good corporate citizen, but also very big and very, uh, uh, very hungry. Uh, so we have an opportunity to make a little go a long way. A lot of that is what AID and others do, but I, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of what ENR is able to do with a very small budget, with our programming in areas like helping on critical minerals surveys and, and helping to develop grid infrastructure and building the software that these countries require to stand on their own. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Kane. Thank you, both of you, for your testimony today. I think this has been a very uh, fruitful and helpful discussion. Uh, members are going to be allowed to submit questions for the record until the close of business on Friday. And with uh, thanks to the subcommittee and the staff that makes this possible, this hearing is adjourned.